start the meeting. This is the uh, uh, monthly meeting of the uh, Board of Commissioners of the uh, Board of Electric Commissioners in Burlington. Uh, we, we hold this meeting the second Wednesday of the month at 530 here at 585 Pine Street. As always, uh, Burlington residents, uh, ratepayers are welcome to come down and join us, join the conversation. Uh, we welcome your comments, questions, and concerns. So let's start us off here. Uh, the first item on the agenda tonight is the agenda. Are there any changes, revisions, or anything that you need to add to it? Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, number two, the minutes of the January 11th, 22 meeting, 2023 meeting, rather. Um, are there any substantive changes to the minutes <clears throat> that need to be brought up? Mm -hmm. um, and if it's just, uh, if it's just a, you know, clerical, Thing we can do that at a, you know, just between you and the clerk. But any, okay. anything of, sub, of substance? No. Hearing nothing, I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the minutes for January 2023. Second. second. Motion and second. Um, discussion on the motion? Okay. Hearing none. Um, Sir, I want to say. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, I'll hear. Yeah, I'll hear. Yeah, I'll take a vote. No, if you don't. No, second it. Yeah, that's it. it passes. All, all, in, all in favor? Say aye. Yes, okay. yes. all in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Um, and number three is public forum. Are there any members of the public? I see no one in the audience. Are there any <coughs> members of the public online? No. Not seeing none. <clears throat> I'll, re I'll reiterate that uh, we're here the second Wednesday of the month, 585. Um, as always, it's an open meeting. You're welcome to come down. Um, any questions, concerns to the department or the board, um, we invite you and welcome, <clears throat> welcome you all here. All right, on to um, item number four, Commissioner's Corner. Do the commissioners have anything that they would like to discuss that's come up in the next month? Last month or so? No, no, no. Well, I will ask about the lighting. Okay. And hopefully, we'll, Darren will have something for us on that. And uh, is that it? Do they have anything? All right. On to the GM update. Before yours, Darren. Thank you very much. Um, with regards to lighting, I believe uh, Munir is working to schedule a meeting, but that there has not yet been a meeting scheduled. Um, so that's all the update I have for that item. Um, the top item uh, in the update is relates to this statement that we uh, put out along with IBEW last week um, related to a proposal in Montpelier uh, to change Vermont's renewable energy standard uh, in a way that would eliminate eligibility for McNeil uh, to count towards Vermont's renewable energy targets and overall would do something that I think is relatively unprecedented uh, anywhere in the country, <coughs> which is to say to a a utility like BED or Washington Electric Co-op or Swanton, who are all 100% renewable already, that you now have to change the way you're 100% renewable and drive up costs uh, for customers, uh, for us perhaps tens of millions of dollars of additional power supply costs, when at the end of the day you're still going to be 100% renewable, just in a different way. Um, so to me that's a fairly uh, concerning um, policy proposal. Uh, we had a fairly strong statement with a lot of good information and data in it on McNeil, uh, sustainability, uh, air emissions controls, uh, jobs and economic impact, um, and carbon profile. So we're engaging uh, heavily in that discussion uh, in Montpelier. Um, there's also the city council has a transportation energy utilities committee that is planning in April to have some sort of uh, meeting uh, focusing on McNeil and uh, looking at it, I think, with the lens of whether district energy is a good thing to have happen or not, uh, whether the plan should continue or not. Uh, we've submitted a list of folks who we think would be good to participate in that meeting. Um, the irony of all this is uh, we've submitted now the Act 250 documents for district energy uh, through Burlington District Energy, our nonprofit uh, partner run by Evergreen. So at this moment where we have this long held community goal of trying to make district energy happen, uh, it feels like there's uh, a particular amount of discussion around McNeil's operations in general. Um, I would say that um, 
this proposal by Renewable Energy Vermont hopefully won't pass as written, uh, but there seems to be some interest, particularly uh, in the House this year in doing something on renewable energy. And um, uh, we're gonna be engaged. Um, this is a rare instance where I would encourage the commission uh, to be engaged uh, as well if you see fit. Um, you know, legislators are gonna be interested in this. Our local city councilors are gonna be interested in this. Um, so I think hearing not only from us and not only from the IBEW, uh, but hearing from the commission about the importance of McNeil and the importance of giving early adopters like BED credit for the work that we've done and not forcing us to abandon existing cost-effective resources for more costly new resources uh, will be an important message to share. Um, and I'd be glad you know, to work with the commission or individual commissioners on uh, avenues for, for sharing that message. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more to come on, on all of that, but I did wanna uh, leave with that item. Um, I can pause there if there are any questions on that piece. I think at the very least we should craft some sort of a, a statement board that'd be great for starters that would be great yeah. very much appreciated um and yeah no but just as a, just as, at the top, off the top of my head i'm sure we could take that a little further but no that's just for yeah. starting we've lost that yeah. yeah i saw the links to the news coverage is there um a deeper dive that talks i mean i'm sure we can find it in the is there an easy link to understand the deeper dive of like so is it a is it directly related? Is it a collateral damage of, of the greater you know policy change? Like, can we understand a little bit deeper? Like, what were the how, does, how did it manifest of being this be the dramatic shift? Yeah, there's there's not a media piece yet that really goes into that level of detail. And the proposal that they made that they announced at their press conference, uh, the bill has not yet come out. Okay. And we're continuing to actively engage to advocate for some of the things we just talked about. Um, there will be a bill that will come out. Um, but really, if I could summarize it, um, the proposal that they have would say that all utilities uh, by 2035 can have 40% of their resources from what we consider existing renewables, um, which means for us, and it's 2023, that in the next 12 years, we have to get 60% of our energy from, quote, new renewable resources. Um, and they would... <clears throat> this, is, this is to me a little bit of gimmickry, but they would propose to change the date of what counts as new renewables in Vermont law from 2015 back to 2010, which may advantage some utilities over others, depending on what investments you made between 2010 and 2015. Doesn't help us with resources like McNeil or Winooski One that are older existing renewables. Um, and then either way, uh, because we currently are able to participate in the New England markets um, with a number of resources, it would change not only potentially our generation mix, but also our rec mix, what we're able to you know, keep, what we sell. Uh, it would phase out eligibility for McNeil relative to Vermont, which may be a market that we want to use for McNeil recs in the future. Uh, we've talked about that with the commission. <clears throat> and then uh, really, if you think about the tens of millions of dollars in costs, it's going to be tied to that change of saying right now, under Vermont law, we're, we have to be 100% renewable generation and recs and then we're able to be exempt from certain pieces because we maintain that level. And of course, BED is actually more than 100%, but under this, uh, we'd be looking at adding um, you know, new recs uh, to the mix, potentially new resources, and um, I, I might be conservative with the tens of millions. I think it could be significant. So we're also gonna seek some analysis uh, on this piece in as short an order as we possibly can to try to inform the discussion as well. And we'll, we'll share that with the commission, of course. We have not disputed this yet. Is the general beef about carbon, or is it about something else? I would submit that this bill proposal, which is being submitted, you know, by Renewable Energy Vermont, is about solar. Um, solar developers want more opportunities to build solar in the state of Vermont, and they feel that the existing markets are not giving them as much runway as they would like. Uh, because according to all the data I'm familiar with from the state and the uh, Energy Action Network, the electric sector now constitutes between 1% and 2% of carbon emissions in the state. Uh, transportation and thermal are 75% roughly. So it's hard for me to understand if it's really about carbon. Um, I think it's really about solar development, which has its own benefits, uh, but needs to be done in a cost-effective way, not in a way that 
you know, you know, drives up rates significantly and adds to costs uh, in our view. That, that answers my question. I was going to ask if it's a, um, like a stake in the ground where they're asking for innovation or if it is like built on understand of maps market transformation, like maps um, known technologies, but yeah. we'll, we'll find out more. Yeah, and it's just rough numbers. Um, the existing renewable energy standard drives roughly 40 megawatts a year of distributed generation solar development through a variety of programs, net metering, uh, power purchase agreements, the standard offer program, uh, 40 megawatts. We had roughly 20 megawatts of solar in the entire state around 2012. Uh, we have about over 400 today, um, and it's a thousand megawatt you know system roughly. Um, so you could have potentially uh, on a day where solar was performing at its at its peak, could provide a significant portion of the energy. But of course, solar has a, a unique profile. It's going to produce more in the summer than the winter. It's going to produce obviously during the day and not in the evening. And it doesn't necessarily align perfectly with where the region's cost drivers are, which tend to be in the winter and in the kind of evening hours now. So solar has a great role to play. We're a huge fan of solar. We will support solar anywhere in the city that we can add it to our mix. And uh, we've been the top city per capita in the Northeast for a number of years now relative to solar, uh, according to Environment America. But what I've heard from the developers is that the PUC is telling them in some cases with projects that they may not be necessary because Vermont's driving 40 megawatts a year of solar, and that's consistent with our current policy. And so they want to change the policy to say, no, we need to have, I don't know, 120 megawatts a year of solar, which, you know, is a different discussion. Uh, and, you know, if we see load growth and other things, that might that might be interesting. But currently, uh, this utility, even though we're trying to drive load growth through EVs and heat pumps, we're not seeing it materially yet in our sales to customers. I don't think other utilities have seen it quite yet either. So it's really like, how are we pacing the development of new resources, the grid, and the cost to customers that I think should be the key driver of the conversation? Other questions? Thanks, we'll, we'll be glad to follow up on that. Um, uh, it's not all uh, bad news in the legislative context. Uh, there's some good things happening uh, as well. Um, and uh, I was down in Montpelier yesterday. We testified in favor of the Affordable Heating Act, which is uh, a potential kind of complement to the RES on the heating side. Um, it includes currently eligibility for renewable district energy as a credit. Uh, so our district energy system would be uh, potentially included in this. Um, it includes a variety of other measures that are fairly consistent with, I think, what Burlington is doing. And the main focus of the utility testimony, not just us, but others, is trying to make sure it aligns well with our existing incentives and how the process will play out at the PUC for determining that. But we have confidence that that will work well. So um, we're hopeful to see that move. Um, and I think uh, the committee has a markup scheduled for later this week. Um, and then after that happens, I believe we'll be working with uh, Efficiency Vermont on the Act 151 extension uh, to let us continue to use our efficiency monies uh, for innovative programs, uh, which we've talked about as well. Um, so on to other news, Emily will probably touch on this more in the financials, but I did want to signal the commission that we are having a warmer than expected winter. Um, as you may recall, when we did our budget, it was really based on the idea that energy prices were going to be fairly high during the winter period. Uh, that's not materialized in December or January. It materialized momentarily over the weekend uh, when we had the cold snap. Uh, but we're back to a period now where prices are frankly at levels that we don't always even see in the shoulder season, and this is during the winter. Um, temperatures in Boston are consistently exceeding 50 degrees. Um, so uh, for the region as a whole, that might be a good thing to have lower prices, but for us in our budget, having planned for the higher prices, it's not a positive and it's challenging us relative to uh, certain metrics uh, and you know is informing our determinations on the FY24 budget that we're working on now. So I wanted to flag that. Obviously, we're doing what we can. Um, we're going to be running McNeil uh, some of the time at 40 megawatts instead of 50 uh, to conserve wood supply for days where there is higher price or, or perhaps for the shoulder season when there might be the opportunity to have more production that wasn't budgeted. Um, so we're going to do what we can in deploying McNeil to mitigate. Um, but I think this budget has been more uh, determined based on those energy prices than any budget I've been part of at BED, and to date, it has not been in our favor. So um, 
you'll you'll see some of the impacts of that, unfortunately, in the financials. Um, District Energy, I uh, mentioned the Act 250 uh, document is in. So what that is is a jurisdictional opinion. Uh, it is from uh, Jeff Hand, who's a lawyer at a um, uh, firm here that's well known for their work on uh, renewable energy at the PUC. Um, they uh, are essentially asserting that as a municipal project, uh, it wouldn't be subject to full Act 250 permit, but would amend existing permits uh, at UVM, UVM Medical, and at city properties. Um, that may or may not be accepted by the uh, district. If it's not accepted, we would have a full Act 250 process. If it is accepted, we'll have a process focused on amendments. Uh, but either way, there will be process uh, with Act 250. Um, it's a momentous uh, step. We've never gone here before with district energy. We've never been designed far enough along for this to happen. Um, we have some other kind of activities going on. Uh, we're working closely with the state on options for financing that would be at maybe a lower rate than uh, what we're seeing in the markets right now, because that's a potential cost driver for the project, these high interest rates that we're seeing. Um, we are working with the federal government to try to bring in uh, the Leahy funding, we're still waiting on the NEPA determination there. Um, and then the uh, DPW uh, in the city has been working with the Evergreen team to try to make sure that we're aligned well on the impacts uh, that there might be from the project and how we work with the water department with um, DPW on streets to make sure that's all working correctly. Um, and I think next week I'm going to be presenting at a UVM medical meeting uh, with their neighbors uh, that they meet with monthly on different um, projects. So uh, that'll be uh, a nice step as well. Uh, financial piece is still moving, so there's still work to be done there. Um, so it's not a done deal yet, of course, but we're continuing to make pretty steady progress on this. Uh, I'll pause, I, I still might be a question. No question. Okay. I'll continue. Um, just two other items from me, um, both of which we had uh, press events for in January. Um, one is uh, what I understand is now going to be ballot item two on the town meeting day ballot is the item that we've worked on with uh, the Department of Permitting uh, related to the carbon pollution impact fee for new construction and large existing buildings that don't go with renewable technology. Uh, we had a nice event at Hula, uh, which is geothermal, heated, and cooled. Uh, we had some Burlington High School students uh, from uh, who had been part of the uh, City and Lake program and uh, were seniors at BHS who spoke. Uh, we had uh, BPIRG, uh, Renewable Energy Vermont, and BNRC on the environmental community side uh, supportive of the initiative. And then we had our partners from uh, the Building Electrification Institute uh, who were joined us remotely uh, to talk about how this work fits with other work that's going on in other communities. So. Uh, big item coming up in just about a month now um, on the town meeting day ballot, and um, we'll we're not uh, we don't advocate for these items uh, as a city department. We just provide information, factual information about the items. So we'll continue to offer information where it's helpful, uh, but it's now in the kind of the, the voting process. So uh, we're not going to be really engaged on that side of things in any way. So we'll see we'll see how that turns out. And then uh, lastly, a little bit earlier in January, we had our announcement around our incentive programs for 2023, some updates some changes, uh, and the new RAP tariff, which um, is now signed officially. Uh, and thanks to uh, Emily for a lot of work on that uh, back and forth with BHFA, as well as James and Chris and others. Um, and so now that program is available. Um, we are officially partners, uh, and we had referenced it earlier in January at the press conference, but now it's going to be an item that we can uh, support customers uh, in terms of on-bill financing for e pump modernization for qualified customers. So another good tool in the toolbox. Um, and we're working as well, as I mentioned here, on a heat pump uh, pilot uh, for designing a potential future heat pump bill credit or rate. Um, I am one of the customers who are going to participate in this pilot uh, and volunteered. Um, so uh, we're going to see if we can kind of look at the real-time data from the heat pumps and have BED send signals to the heat pumps to be able to uh, reduce energy use uh, in, a, in certain quantities, not completely, obviously, uh, during peak periods in the winter and summertime. And then we're going to use that data to try to drive a design of a program to benefit customers in the future. And I'm a volunteer, too. Yes. James's pumps are also signed up as well as mine. Um, that's everything I've got. Excellent. Any questions? Um, so, on the last thing you mentioned, the uh, the wrap. Uh, 
So I've been in touch with Brian and Energy Services, and I'm going to see if uh, what everything works out that I can be one of the first people to take advantage of all these things. Excellent. Weatherizing and, and pumping my house. So Excellent. We'll see what happens. We're, 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 we're at the start, start on the customer the, experience. We're at the, yeah, exactly. Excellent. So we're at the start of our journey with, with this. So That's great. See, see how it works out. Thank you for that. Yep. Okay. Next would be item number five, or no, item number six, rather, the FY23 financials for December. Emily. financials were materially worse than budget, um, mainly due to lower than budgeted energy prices. Um, and I can tell you now that January is going to be materially worse, worse than, worse than this. Um, and yeah, so I think we, you know, we're talking to the commission about the unprecedented, unprecedented um, nature of the energy forwards, the volatility. Um, we knew that there was a risk of a mild winter um, affecting um, affecting our power supply, and it's been a mild winter. So here we are. Um, so we, as a management team, will be taking actions. Um, you know, are taking actions, but we'll continue to uh, probably spend you know, serious time on this over the next few weeks um, to figure out how to respond to this and in particular preserve cash um, for the remainder of the fiscal year. So what I'm going to share with you isn't great, but I'm just letting you know that next month my story will be even sadder, unfortunately. Um, Question? Yes. Um, in this table, <coughs> it looks like the big hit is from power supply expenses. Uh, considerably greater than we thought. And what I heard you say was we had a problem selling the stuff. So I'm not sure I see the connection. Yep. Um, let me walk you through, and then when I after I, if after I cover the power supply, I haven't answered your question, let me know, and we'll come back to that. Um, so for the month, uh, we had uh, a, a net loss of $66,000 compared to a budgeted net income of $434,000, so we're half a million off for the month of where we uh, wanted to be. Um, for the year to date, we are just under a million dollars off with a net loss of $921,000 for the year to date versus a budgeted net income of $712,000. Okay. So walking through the details, sales to customers are generally speaking, right on budget. Um, you know, they're a little up and down, but generally speaking, we're only $200,000 off for the year. We had a positive variance of 53,000 for December, and that's generally, like, that's really great, you know, <laughs> as these things can go. Um, other revenues for December had a positive variance of $146,000, most of that uh, returns from the EEU fund, which are offset by EEU expenses on the expense side. Uh, there were no rec revenues in December, as was budgeted. Now moving to power supply expense. 
which as Commissioner Harrington noted, was $913,000 worse than budget. So power supply, as many of you know, is a combination of several different elements. Um, and so for December, wood fuel expense was over budget uh, by $350,000 roughly. Part of that um, being due to the price that we're paying is higher than budget in order to ensure that we have adequate wood supply. We also ran McNeil 18% more than budget. Um, and so therefore we expensed more wood fuel. That's one element of the 913. Purchase power, second element, was $580,000 worse than budget. Within purchase power, there are several subsections. One is capacity, um, and that is where the um, unanticipated payments for Mystic are coming in. So there was almost, a, most of that 150 was a $147,000 capacity payment uh, for the Mystic plant. And then energy charges were also worse than budget by $242,000. Of that, 147 was related to the ISO exchange. And what we had happening there was we had a positive volume variance because we were running McNeil more than we had budgeted, so we had more energy to sell. However, the price was a lot less than we had budgeted. So the positive volume variance was more than offset by a negative price variance. And then transmission actually helped us. That was slightly, slightly better than budget. So I'll just pause there, Commissioner Herndine. Did that um, answer your question? Sorry, no, I still don't see it. Um, most of those numbers you just mentioned, I can't even find. Well, they all sum up the net to the 913. Okay. And the biggest one is of that 913? The biggest one was purchased power, the combination of capacity and energy. But uh, I say I, I get prices are down because of the warm winter. Yes. You, you bought lots more because why? We what? Why didn't we buy more? We didn't buy more. We sold at less of a profit, you could say, right? So. Did um, you call that an expense? It's yes. A variance. We well, had it budgeted for a positive expense variance, you could say. Instead. We had a real expense, <laughs> as opposed to a negative expense. Sales is an intake of money. Expenses is an outflow of money. Yes. But when I look at this table and then I listen to you, I'm hearing it doesn't work that way. Yeah, I mean, I see your point. I see your point. We don't. We budget for the excess energy that we sell through the ISO exchange as part of the power supply expense budget. Yeah, the power supply expense, it might help them lead to remind folks, is net power supply expenses. So it's power supply expenses, net of power supply revenues. Which so includes both direct revenue expenses. and any Correct. excess energy sold on the ISO exchange. Okay, so a, sales, a sale to customer is not a power supply revenue. Correct. Correct. So, and it doesn't help you to produce less product, less energy, because... because mm -hmm. Well, the, the real but question you're not is... Selling, you're selling at a, low, at a lower price than you anticipated, but you're still selling it. So instead correct. of making a dollar on every unit, you're making... Right, as long as the marginal price is above our marginal cost, yeah. right? And, and then you have to, to factor in the recs that we generate, which are then available to sell as part of that, then yes, you're right. However, we have, we have been watching the prices and positioning the plant to conserve wood so that we're not running full tilt, so to speak, so that in the chance that prices in March, April, May, or June are better than anticipated, we will have wood supply to run then. Which so if we're quick... running full tilt now, we'd expect to kind of be out of wood by the end of March. Just a that quick note, sense. that's true, everything we said for units where we can control the output. So if it's a contracted resource, like a wind resource or a hydro resource, there's either no variable cost in the case of a hydro, say, or we're not able to interrupt the output of the wind resources under contract. So, but yes, in general, we are not losing money. We are making less than we thought. 
materially so. I'm embarrassed to, I guess, make it clear, I have never understood this after all these years. Um, so when we take the difference between operating revenues and total expenses, we come up with operating income, mm -hmm. which checks with what I would normally think of when I said operating revenues sounded like expenses and didn't include income. So it's, it's still um, confusing. If but that wasn't a question, I knew you could say, okay, so you're confused. Let's move on. <laughs> well, I would offer that if it helps, on, I think it's page seven, every time of the packet, let me see if I'm right, or of the financial packet. Yes. On page seven of the financials is a breakdown of net power supply. Right, as James said. So that includes both the expenses of power supply and the revenues of power supply. And the, um, Can you switch to the power supply detail for a second, maybe Emily, too? Uh, the purchase power detail? Yes. I'm on the yeah. Uh, yeah. The next thing I ask that unless other people are worried about this, it sounds like I have to do some homework, so I'll do it. Okay. And I'm happy to have you give me a call and we can go over it in detail if you want. Yeah. yeah, I would refer you to pages kind of seven through nine where the detail is laid out and then certainly let us know if you have other questions. But it does seem like the worry is, so what is this? We need to like rate payers. And, and BED is an agency, right? Which, um, but I think a lot of what we are interested in is the impact to the residents, so the people in Burlington. And of course it's kind of like a, bad time because we just had a rate increase. Like we've asked for a lot of money and um, the communities have invested in BED and so to be have this deficit at this moment uh, is unfortunate. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So that's what you all are going to do say like which levers you can pull and push. I, I want to yes um, in certain years there are more levers you can or push and I think we're a little constrained at the moment both because given so much variance was on the power supply piece there's there are very few pieces of budget that you can change that have an equal impact to the power supply piece and unlike uh, prior years uh, much of our capital budget is is revenue bond projects so they're going to be reimbursed but uh, deferring or canceling them doesn't really save money in the long run uh, in prior years where we've had a capital budget that wasn't based on the revenue bond uh, deferring projects might save you on your cash and, and be worthwhile. Um, so we're going to look at everything. We're going to look at um, even things like uh, towards the year end, making sure that revenue bond expenditures that we make are able to be reimbursed in the same fiscal year so that we can bring an appropriate amount of cash on hand in the next fiscal year. Uh, we're having uh, monthly executive team meetings with uh, the finance team and the policy and planning teams. Uh, staff to go over opportunities to reduce expenditures or defer expenditures. But I am concerned because this is, uh, barring a change in the weather and a change in prices, uh, our opportunities as outlined are really uh, limited to kind of change the power supply trajectory. And um, it's one thing if we don't quite hit our net income metric or our adjusted debt service coverage ratio metrics, those are unfortunate uh, potentially and not something that we welcome. The bigger concern is going to be cash on hand uh, heading <clears throat> into uh, next year's budget. Uh, we strive to maintain the 90 days cash on hand. Uh, that's the A rating metric for Moody's and we feel is a safe metric uh, for BED. And uh, just maintaining that this year under this circumstance, if it continues, is gonna be a challenge. And then that also puts additional pressure on next year's rate requirement um, as well. So it's something we've this is going to be a big part of the budget discussion going forward, unless the dynamic fundamentally changes uh, in the power supply piece. Yeah, so um, tough conundrum. Yes. So you can't, and, and I think also that's why the public also gets frustrated, right? Because I said, don't do the streetlight projects, right? Save that money, but you can't do that because that's a different fund. I'm not. I know that may or may not be the right example, but I know capital and operating are often really separate for public agencies. Right. I guess is my point. Yeah, and the street lighting, while there's, there's some expense, wouldn't be at the magnitude 
even if we deferred all of it, that it would probably solve this problem. But uh, if we had street lighting taken away from us as a responsibility, it'd probably be net positive from an economic standpoint. We'd welcome that if uh, there's interest. But um, absent something like that, it probably wouldn't have the impact financially to make a huge difference, unfortunately. And then are there any lessons? Like, did we gamble too much on this? or? Uh, the challenge, I think, is the timing of it, because when we were putting together the rate case, the forwards were very high, and you can't go into the public utility commission process with the forwards being that high, and if you attempt to be more conservative, um, it, it may not play out kind of correctly in the rate process. And the one thing I would say um, is we don't have what um, some of the utilities that are under an alternative regulation plan on our investor own, like Vermont Gas and GMP, have a fuel adjustment clause. So if you're a Vermont Gas customer, you'll see that the commodity price changed and the gas rate changed uh, earlier this year, or, or I should say later last year, uh, when there was upward pressure. And I think on a recent bill I saw that the commodity price changed and the gas price is going to decrease. And all of that happens relatively automatically at the Public Utility Commission. We don't have any of that. So we are under a traditional rate making process where each year you go in with the numbers that you have and they may change and there's no real mechanism to adjust the rate need or have any sort of supplementary charge for a period of time to adjust for fuel costs or they also have storm adjusters in some cases as well. So that would be a nice tool in the toolbox. You might be able to, if you were looking at something like this, you might have been able to say, okay, we're going to have a temporary surcharge during this period to cover the cost, the right. differential, but then it's not going to necessarily affect our cash and rate needs for next year. And unfortunately, that's not the way it works for us. So it will affect those things. Um, and that's something that not only we looked at would require legislative change, but a charter change and a vote. And it, it's a lengthy process. So not something that would be an easy tool to access for us, unfortunately. But would, would help resolve this issue a little bit. Um, we're going to do everything we can. We will have a rate requirement for next year. There will be a rate change for next year. Um, we'll do everything we can to keep it as reasonable as possible, given the various dynamics on the power supply side. And I think if we see forwards for next year that look like the forwards this year, um, we would probably advocate for being more conservative with them in the process, whether that gets upheld in a, in a rate making process is, is to be determined. It's so complicated, right? Because we're paying extra to have additional fuel supply on hand, but then the prices are really, it's like, it's hard for me to keep it all straight, but. Um, Again, well, keep in mind, we're not operating at a loss. We're just not no, operating at yeah. the desired profit. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a frustrating dynamic and all things equal, if the prices had been higher this winter, uh, we'd be going into the next fiscal year with a larger cash uh, reserve. Our rate need would be lower. It would be beneficial for our customers. Um, we're not in that place at the moment. Um, inflation is still fairly high, still impacting supply chain. Uh, we do have, you know, labor cost increases and other things that would drive a rate need regardless. So the question is, how much can we mitigate the impact of these changes, uh, both in this fiscal year and then for next fiscal year? Right. I mean, the numbers that were included in our rate case for the value of selling this excess power for January and February are roughly four times what it's actually been coming in at. So, you know, again, it's coming in at above variable cost, but it's coming in at, you know, a quarter of what was expected. So that's how big a change this is. Rest of the numbers here pale by comparison, um, but I'll continue to walk you through them nonetheless. Um, other operating expense other than power supply had a relatively small variance of $136,000 over budget, largely due to timing. Um, moving down out of the operating piece into other income and deductions, we had a positive variance there for the month. Um, of $346,000. That's a combination of things. Um, interest rates have gone up, so interest income is higher. Um, gains on investments were higher than budgeted, and our uh, miscellaneous non-operating income was also higher, driven by customer contributions to capital projects. Um, 
so as I, as, as I said at the top, in sum, we had a net loss um, for the month of 209,000 and a net loss for the year of 921,000. Move to capital spending for December um, was $4.2 million to date uh, compared to the budget for the year to date of $5.6 million. Um, as Darren mentioned, we're continuing to see supply chain delays of getting materials, uh, but we are keeping projects moving, um, ordering well in advance. Um, and being creative with our, you know, our planning and procurement strategies um, as, as well as we can be. The cash position for the department as of the end of December was $4.7 million. Uh, that is uh, well below the budgeted uh, target we had for December of 8.9. Uh, that is the impact mostly of the lower energy prices. I can tell you that cash improved for January a little bit um, by about a million dollars. Um, still well below where, uh, where we budgeted it, it to be and it's well below where we need to end the year to have 90 days. So we'll be taking steps in the next month or so to preserve cash. And that concludes my report unless there are a few other questions. Another healthy mm -hmm. four or five more million in there. I've seen it as high as 12, so that's, that's scary. Um, so I question that last year, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 10 to 12. 10 to 12 million there. Any questions for Emily? Thank you, I guess. Um, next thing would be the IRP forecast update, and that's with James. Cannot hear you, sir. Still can. Um, there we go. No, that's, that was joking. Um, sorry, I'm not there in person. Normally, I would prefer to present in person, but I'm sick, and you definitely do not want to get whatever I've got. Um, <clears throat> we wanted to come in and give a brief after the last commission meeting where there were some questions about the IRP. We wanted to show some information on where things stand. In particular, today, we're going to talk a bit about the forecast. Um, and some of the key driving variables and where our forecast cases are landing on those variables. Uh, because we have a couple of new commissioners, uh, Emily, next slide, please. Um, I'm going to remind folks what is an IRP. Uh, that is a triennial utility obligation created by 30 Vermont statutes annotated 218C. Um, I had to look up triennial to make sure I got that right, but it is triennial, not triannual. Um, and you can read that at your leisure. We'll be sharing the PowerPoint after the meeting. Um, we'll share it with Lori and she can circulate it. But it's really just a, a plan for meeting the public's needs at the lowest possible life cycle cost, but including environmental and economic costs. And really, you have to consider all types of investments. So energy supply, transmission, distribution, transmission, efficiency, um, and then consider those economic costs in relation to those four criteria. It's, next slide, please. It is perhaps as interesting to talk about what is an IRP not. And an IRP is not an actual approval to undertake any of the actions that the IRP or the plan concluded were appropriate. So when your IRP is approved, if in your IRP you said you're gonna pursue a new wind generating station, that doesn't get approved. That's not what is being approved when the IRP is approved. It's not a determination of prudency with regard to any action with respect to rate recovery either. So you can have actions in the IRP that is approved, that is an approved IRP that you then may have to seek permitting approval for. Uh, you could be chastised in a rate case for it being an imprudent decision. An IRP is not protection against any of those things. And so, you know, if something requires PUC approval, like building a generating plant, it will still require the same PUC approval, even if it was included in an IRP as an action step. It does have the advantage under, whoops, I'm sorry, I wasn't, let me go back for a second. 30 DSA 248 does have a little context that says, 
with respect to, per, and 30 VSA 248 is the Certificate of Public Good statute criteria, and sat, statute criteria number six, which is one of the things you have to satisfy, says that with respect to purchase investments or constructions by a company is consistent with the principles for resource selection expressed in the company's approved IRP. So really, approval equates to approval of the decision-making process decide, described in that IRP, not any of the results. And honestly, you know, if you had concluded something, but an assumption needed to be updated before you made a decision and you didn't do it, that would be imprudent. So an IRP is a snapshot at a moment of time at how you make decisions about resources and how you balance them against each other. Next slide, please. Some of the major statutory components of an IRP, and these are pieces we'll be bringing to you. Um, the forecast is certainly the primary one. That's a, that's a primary input. And the forecast is telling you what load you're trying to serve. Uh, the forecast in our case is actually net of energy efficiency, effectively, because the target for energy efficiency is decided in a second process called a demand resources plan. So these are two disconnected three-year processes, one of which determines the appropriate amount to spend on energy efficiency, and the other does really everything else. So we inject the amount from our most recent DRP as a reduction in the load forecast under our integrated resource plan for energy efficiency. So we're not really trading that off against anything, and the, and the target is maximum achievable potential, so you really can't change its amount all that much, even if you want to. You are doing resource evaluations, and there are trade-offs. So, for example, you know, you you if you could do more energy efficiency, you could consider that an alternative to buying a new resource. If you needed distribution upgrades, you could potentially consider demand response and lowering the demands that you're forecasting, a trade-off against distribution. But the distribution evaluation is a very big piece of it, and that certainly was a major focus of the last integrated resource plan, where we specifically looked at significantly increasing loads, loads increasing well in excess of anything we'd ever put in an IRP. Um, in particular, we'd never done an IRP at Burlington Electric before the last one that considered loads in excess of 80 megawatts. The last IRP had a case at 102.8 megawatts, and that would be a case driven by significant new electrification loads. You consider the economic impact of the choices you're making. And so, for example, you would be looking at a, an energy resource, and you would say, based on all of the assumptions in the IRP, would investing in this energy resource increase or decrease the economic impacts on my customers under these various cases or various assumption sets? And you do try to develop a rate trajectory. You're looking for something that, a, a, a sort of total plan that yields the lowest rate trajectory while accomplishing your goals. We do also look at environmental impacts, and we can look at them both from a monetary point of view, if there is a monetary market that captures that value, or we can simply look at it from a carbon dioxide emissions point of view, even if there is no market. And we could assign a value to that, but it would be a non-economic value if we did that. It wouldn't go into the rate path. So unless there's a way to monetize it from a rate path point of view, you can consider it, but it won't affect your rate path directly. It might affect your decisions. Next slide, please. The DPS issued new guidance for IRPs on December 30th, 2022. That is an update from the prior 2016 version, which governed our last IRP. This is not an exhaustive list of what they've added, but it's some of the more significant ones. And they've added sections on environmental justice, public participation, and technology development flow charts. And that's really, a lot of that is on the distribution side. That's not a lot of time in a three-year process for us to incorporate these suggestions by September. We will be reviewing to what extent can we accomplish a, a guidance. By the way, the, the guidance was issued in draft form on December 30th. Comments from everybody were due January 31st, and I don't think they've issued a final version yet. So at some point, it becomes very difficult to incorporate new guidance in a document that's due in a certain number of months. So we will look at these. If we can incorporate them, we will do so. Um, if not, we will let the department know, essentially, that they either need to extend the timeline or recognize that they will not be included in this IRP. One other thing I'll mention is that there is also an MOU that was signed as a result of the last IRP that has certain actions that we have to take, and those will have to be in this IRP. So, for example, updating the McNeil economic analysis is one of them. 
Uh, next slide, please, Emily. From the forecast front, second. Bless you. So, sorry, from the forecasting front, you know, unlike in prior IRPs, some of the assumptions regarding the pace of electrification are really the biggest unknowns in terms of impact on the load we will be serving. In prior IRPs, 2008, 12, 16, et cetera, you know, there was a lot of discussion about what are you going to forecast for a change in GDP? You know, uh, what do you think the population in Burlington will be doing over the 20 years? Compared to the effect that those kind of variables can have on the load forecast, the assumptions about new EV deployments and about new heat pump deployments and about how much they will consume wildly, you know, crush the impact of those types of variables. So what will drive the cases here that between the low base and high case, where we try to look at multiple cases and see how robust the answers are at different levels of load, do you get the same answer if you don't get a lot of deployment? Do you get the same answer if you get more deployment than you expected? The drivers for the number of EVs and the number of heat pumps is really going to be two of the biggest things we've got to deal with. And we've got a couple of slides where we want to talk about those deployment rates. Pregnant pause for next slide. Thank you. Anyway, pardon me again. This is the IRP deployment, EV deployment trajectories. The gray line, the blue line, and the orange line are from the current IRP draft. And they represent deployment rates of electric vehicles under what we are calling low base and high case. In this case, it was fairly easy to give a comparative value from the net zero roadmap. And that is the 20, the green line is the 2030 net zero roadmap deployment rate of EVs to achieve net zero in the transportation sector by 2030. And this particular graph is focusing on light duty vehicles, which is really the predominant type of, of vehicle that's being modeled. The right hand margin shows the approximate saturation or market share under each of the cases. The only qualifier I need to give you, and the reason there's an asterisk under market share, is that the denominators for these two calculations are not the same. The net zero roadmap used an increasing number of EVs over time, so it's a growing denominator. And the IRP cases right now for load ratio share are calculated on a static 25,000 roughly vehicles in Burlington. If you were to change the denominator to, to the IRP to the uh, net zero case for the three IRP scenarios, they would drop relative to the 98% in the net zero roadmap. Those that 81% market share, 60 and 32, I can't read it. Sorry, 53 would all drop relative to the 98. The 98 would stay the same. We are having some difficulty putting these things directly against each other. And we're going to talk about that particularly in the next slide, which is on heat pump rates. But I mean, I think the what this shows is that there is a shortfall between the projected deployment rate of under the IRP scenarios. The base case would have us at 60% roughly of market share. And we knew that. We, we don't necessarily think that we are on trajectory to meet the 2030 net zero roadmap. So the gap above those cases doesn't surprise me that much. You can also see, by the way, the blue line on the left is our historical deployment rate. And you can see that the blue line, the base case line, is really driven strongly by ITRON's forecasting off of past practice. And then we are judgmentally adjusting it upwards or downwards. Uh, I'm sorry, I just was going to ask if there were any particular questions on that slide right now. The EV one? Yes, please. I'm curious why you're counting vehicles and not vehicle miles. We, hey, well, we're, we're using the deployment of vehicles and then vehicle miles is a function of, of creating an average use. So these vehicle deployments to become electric consumption get multiplied by an average use. The average use is affected by vehicle miles driven for Burlington only, Burlington customers. So these, these become energy sales forecasts when coupled with forecasts of average use over time. And there's no nuance between like miles for an electric vehicle versus a ICE or whatever? 
in this particular context under the IRP, I don't believe there is. Under the net zero roadmap, there are some very complicated interplays. For example, they're you know, projecting increasing efficiency of vehicles over time and things like that. But, but by and large, you know, this is based on an average use assumption over time. We can pull that, but I don't have it with me as a graph. We I don't do. necessarily think it's static, by the way, either. Yeah, I was just going to say, James, we do track a kind of VMT data in the roadmap updates mm -hmm. uh, using an average that's based on the uh, two years trailing based on the local uh, county regional planning numbers and one year trailing based on the state average. Right. And and the, you know, there's so, there's multiple sources of average mileage. You could have the, what's called the tier three tag technical advisory group assumptions about my vehicle miles. Um, I'd have to get the actual assumption about vehicle miles because what I've actually got is consumption per vehicle per year, which then gets multiplied by deployment rate in vehicles per year. Because again, we're concerned in terms of a load forecast about electric energy at the end of the day. Any other okay. questions on this? Sorry, just a clarifying question. You said this was the old IRP modeling, though, and you're going to be updating it through your no, process. No, 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 no. This oh, no, is this the is the current. Okay. It's current okay. IRP modeling against the net zero roadmap okay. in green. Okay. These are the assumptions that we're making that are two critical ones that are driving the load court forecast scenarios that we will then go on to analyze in the R IRP in terms of distribution impacts, economic impacts, environmental impacts, and, and everything else. Thanks. And in all of this, again, remember, in three years, you'll be updating the IRP. So, you know, unless you're making a 20-year decision, you're not really relying that heavily on those out years right now because you know that the, the uncertainty out there is higher than it is up front, for sure. Next slide, please. So this is the potential heat pump trajectories. And I want to note right away that we have changed your comparative measure here from being the net zero roadmap to being the Green Mountain Power base case. The If the comparisons in load ratio share in the EVs are difficult, the comparisons for deployment rates of heat pump technology between the net zero roadmap and the IRP modeling is very difficult. And we'll probably need Synapse to calculate a few things for us before we can actually do that. Synapse is looking in, at whole home conversions to heat pumps over time with a changing percentage of the home load being served by the heat pump over time and with changing efficiencies in heat pumps over time. That is almost certain, and it's displacing anywhere from 75 to 85% of the heating load in the house over the evaluation window in the Synapse report. You know that's not a single head, you know, mini split. So all of the IRP modeling done by ITRON, who's our, our forecasting consultant, is based around heat pump counts. They have also done that work for Green Mountain Power. So the Green Mountain Power is a deployment of units of heat pumps, as are our three graphs. We are trying to convert the net zero roadmap to being equivalent, but it requires some estimates of the average number of heat pump units required to do what they've modeled in their plan, in their roadmap. That's proving difficult. So we've given you at least one comparison, because otherwise I would just be showing you three lines that curve with no frame of reference as to what anybody else thinks might be going on. The yellow line is GMP's base case. What this data shows is that we are below GMP's base case, in our base case, the blue line, and the gray line, which is our low case, and only in our high deployment rate case are we exceeding GMP's base case. GMP's high case would probably be higher than our high case, virtually certain, and I guarantee you that the net zero roadmap would be higher than all of those. Okay, and as soon as we can do that math, if we can do that math, we'll put that out as well. But this feels sort of intuitively correct to me in the sense that at a base case deployment rate, I would expect GMP to be deploying heat pumps faster than Burlington Electric. We are looking at competing against a 95% saturation of natural gas, 
they have significant oil and propane that they are competing against. They do not have universality of natural gas in their customer base. And the economics of deploying a heat pump against oil and propane are certainly better than deploying them against natural gas today. Now they've gotten better. As Darren has said, you know, we're probably a little bit above break even right now. You know, but you know, again, it's you're incurring a capital cost to more or less break even, whereas against oil and propane, you're incurring a capital cost to save operating cost. It's better economics. Um, again, you know, we're not surprised that our heat pump deployments would not be meeting the net zero deployment rates. Again, there's no reason that they would. We don't have a program or an active dynamic or a requirement or something else that would push us to the net zero deployment rate yet. That's what we're trying to do when we're looking at the net zero roadmap is figure out how to close the gaps and, and move the deployment rates so the technology is up to where they need to be. Are, are you considering um, the overlay of Vermont gases efforts in this play, efforts in this sphere because of um, it not being a whole cloth replacement, but actually encouraging, um, at least through their pilot, the re remaining heating system in place, but the heat pump being an uh, addition and therefore potentially extending that. I'm not sure if I'm reflecting. Sure, sure. I'm just thinking of like if you're looking at models for understanding number of your 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 impact and your uh, amount of impact. Um, you have obviously another person and another entity who's um, playing in the space, and I'm just curious about your overlay of Vermont Gas's activities around heat pumps and what that does if if they're um, highlighting Unle the unless Vermont Gas's activities would push us outside of the orange line, which I don't see in any case, right? We will be testing a case that's that high, right? I mean, again, we will be testing a combined high case, which would be the summation of high heat pump deployment in residential units, the, the high deployment of EVs, and that will become a load forecast that is tested for its impact on our system and our decisions. So unless you think their actions would put us totally out of the bounds of any of these three cases, then I'm not terribly worried about that. That sounds, yeah, I would think it would just be more actually push the other way. It would decrease the potential run rate for how, how much adoption you would get. Just well, it depends. Like I say, you know, you, you, can, you can use those explanations to understand what might move you from the base case to the high case or the low case, or what might be needed to move you there. And you can use that when you're deciding what case you put the most weight on in terms of deciding to make investments. You don't want to sit there and invest in T&D upgrades on the orange curve without some real reason to believe that you're not going to be on the blue line. What's going to cover the, uh, the gap between uh, 20 below zero and the heat pump? In all of these cases, that would be covered by residual gas and fossil fuel use. Even in, that's also in the net zero roadmap. It's just a question of how much of it's left. I mean, I, I personally have two heat pumps. I was very pleased to see that over the cold weather, um, they operated two rating. They are, they are spec'd out for minus 14, and they produced heat to minus 14. And then they stopped. And But there was enough buffer in the house that my oil bills have been brutally driven down by having the two heat pumps this year. It's not been, it hasn't been that cold either. It's been a really good year for, you know, high efficient, super high efficiency heat pumps. And that, is, that answers my question of your, the modeling is continuous consumption of other heating equipment. So that, yes. That has, to be. Interesting. has to be. And even in, like I say, even in the net zero roadmap, they do not assume a technology where heat pumps can displace 100% of fossil fuel use by 2030 or 2040. They don't uh, have a baseboard heating backup instead of gas? I don't think they assume a change to the backup heating unit. Um, I'd have to double check that. The model's pretty deep, Bob, as to whether they actually 
I think what they're doing is they're replacing natural gas customers with heat pumps and, the, and a residual natural gas load. I don't think that they're moving that residual load then over to electric, but that I would have to check. That would require a fair a bit of digging into the model. I can do it, I just don't know the answer. So what we're doing though is we're combining these cases to drive variations around a base case. So that we're not sitting there 20 years ago, the IRP would have had a single forecast line and all of your planning would be meeting that forecast. And you would assume the forecast was accurate. Now you're gonna be looking at, you know, what happens, what do you need if you do hit the orange line? When do you need it? You know, what's the most economical way to meet the orange line? That kind of thing. So IRPs in Vermont no longer are single case evaluations. Now, you know, we can update, we will provide this PowerPoint, share it with you guys. We will continue to develop PowerPoints to explain the steps that we're taking through the IRP. We will also, though, share this PowerPoint with the DPS and elicit their comments um, because we have an obligation under our MOU to begin engaging with the DPS six months before filing, which I think ends up being end of this month. So it's timed very well. We will just simply share the PowerPoint as we have always done in the past. In the past, whenever we did an IRP PowerPoint for the BEC, or any of the committees, we would share it with the DPS right afterwards and seek their commentary, and then let you guys know what their commentary is, if it's material. And that is the end of the PowerPoint. Thank you, James. Any other questions from? All right, well, we'll see where this goes. Thank you very much. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. That's due in September, right? September, yeah. September, September 1st. All right. Um, thank you, Jason. We'll go on to uh, item number eight, Commissioner's check in. I wanted to give uh, uh, Commissioner Whitaker an opportunity to just, if you want to do something we talked about before you came in, to just a brief, if you need a brief. Uh, yeah, just quickly, I saw update. the um, renewable energy standard and the wood thing. Did you guys spend a lot of time talking about that? A little bit. We did, and okay. um, uh, I mentioned that. Uh, well, we, we shared the statement uh, that I hope you you saw an email. Uh, I was in Montpelier yesterday. We're going to spend a lot of time advocating uh, about that, um, and we welcome and, and this is part of the conversation the commission's uh, active engagement on the issue as well. And so, um, Chair Bowie suggested the commission might be willing to put together some sort of statement. Um, that might be helpful for us in terms of uh, sharing with legislators, but also sharing uh, locally with the city council, because there's going to be a, a forum potentially with the Transportation and Energy Utilities Committee at the council on wood energy in uh, April. Um, so we welcome the commission's engagement on, on both of those uh, areas. Okay, and there's no nuance in the standard for like the scrap part that it's like, you know, it's not. Um, well, there is currently, I mean, current law, uh, certainly allows us to uh, count wood energy towards Vermont's renewable targets. Um, this proposal, as it was laid out last week by Renewable Energy Vermont, and which of course is subject to change, and which we hope will change, uh, as it was drafted and announced at the press conference, would simply phase out eligibility regardless of sustainable harvesting, regardless of okay. the district energy project, and uh, we think that's not good policy. I did have a question. I should have asked James. Are you still there, James? Looks like he did. Looks like he signed up. He didn't sign up so good. Benjamin James. Yeah, he wasn't feeling 100%. Okay. Never mind. Any other? He caught that just as he came back into the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for being but then he had to find his cursor, which slowed him down for a few seconds. All right, well, uh, just context. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks uh, that we kick up in one previous IRP to 102 megawatts. Uh, what kind of upper limits are you thinking about here, or is it premature? It's, it's ITRON will need to run the energy forecasts through a peak demand model. And we need to then understand, it won't be as high as, as the 140 megawatts because none of the ITRON cases are net zero by 2030 or 2040.
but we need to make sure that we understand if we get numbers that are lower than 140, what's driving the difference? Is it an assumption about the saturation? Is it that the average use assumptions are different? Um, that is still in process. Converting an energy forecast to a peak demand forecast is still in process. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, James. Any other items that the commissioners want to bring up? One once, one twice. I'll take a motion. Make the motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 You have to wear the sweatshirt to make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get the memo. Uh, I'll stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.